Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, and welcome to this, our session in this series, Living Through the Liturgical Year. Let us begin with a word of prayer as we ask God's guidance upon us at this time. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we give you thanks for the wonders of your creation, for the beauty that surrounds us, for the gift of life. We especially thank you for granting us the opportunity to share in it all. We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that we may come to a greater appreciation of your creation, our place in it, and seek to do your service so that others may come to experience the beauty that surrounds them and find you in all that is around us. These things we ask for your gracious name's sake. Amen. Good evening once again, everyone. We continue this evening with our liturgical year and we're looking at the season of Christmas. You may recall that the last time we were here, at the season of Advent, and we saw how the church was able to use the natural cycle of what is happening, what is taking place in the environment around us, to help us to focus spiritually on our relationship with God and our future hope. And so on that occasion, we discussed how Advent has a dual focus. There's the first Advent when we celebrate the coming of Christ as a babe at Bethlehem, and then there's the second advent when we anticipate his second coming as judge of all things so because of those two focal points the first advent points to a joyful celebration and so we have the themes of hope peace joy and love and we spoke about how the advent wreath helps us to keep that liturgical time of those four sundays before christmas as we reflect on some advent of the promise of this coming Christ. So we have the hope as expressed in the prophecies of the Old Testament, the Messiah will come. We hear about the peace of Bethlehem and the peace that this Messiah will bring. We hear about the joy, the joy of the shepherds and the joy of all who experience this Christ. And then we experience the love of God as pointed out by St. John in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so as we lead up to the season of Christmas, our focus on the first advent prepares us to celebrate the joy of the first coming of Christ. But we also have to focus on the fact that he will come again. And this is where the penitential aspect of advent came in. And as I pointed out, we sometimes see churches using different colors. Those that stress heavily on the first advent and the joyous mode use like a light blue or sarum blue. And those that focus on the penitential aspect more so keep the penitential color of violet or purple. And hello? Am I, is everyone hearing me? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm hearing some background noise, that's why. So we, we celebrate, those who focus on the second advent, focus on the penitential aspect and what we refer to as the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. And as I would have pointed out, what the church is really doing is linking what has taken place on the outside to what it wants to focus on on the inside. And so on the outside, that time of year is when the days begin to get darker more quickly. The days are shorter, leading up to December 21st, which is, the shortage, which is the shortest day of the year. And so the church tells us, look outside, look around you. You see how things are slowing down and the leaves are falling from the tree and everything is coming to a standstill. You're part of that creation. And so you must now, before that happens to you, wake up 
and seek to serve God even more so that you will be found ready when he comes the second time to receive you into his kingdom. There's a hymn that we sing, hymn 507 CPWI, which holds these two focal points of Advent together in two of their verses, I think is the first and the last verse. So let's just look at how it does that. The first verse speaks to the first Advent. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. So that speaks about the first coming of Christ when we remember the account given by St. Luke and, and later St. Matthew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, and there was no room for him in the inn, etc. So that's the first advent. But if you look at the, the, the final verse of that hymn, when the heavens shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. This is now speaking about the second advent that we would have prepared ourselves. So when Jesus comes the second time, we will find that there's room in his kingdom for us. Remember John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. All of these things point to the second coming of Christ. And so Advent reminds us, prepare yourselves, stay awake, keep your lamps trimmed, make sure that your loins are girded, stay focused so that when Christ comes, he may find you working. So that basically is what we looked at last week, the two focal points of Advent. And someone said, but why didn't you mention the fact that during Advent, we don't have the flowers in the church? And for example, at St. George, we do not use incense. The mass is not the high solemn mass because it is a penitential season. We are bearing ourselves in preparation for the joyous season of Christmas and ultimately the coming of Christ. Now today, we will look at the second season of the liturgical year, which is Christmas. Christmas is a season of 12 days and it begins on the evening of December 24th. And because it is a season of thanksgiving and joy, the liturgical color is white or gold. Now during the season, there are many different little celebrations that we have and I'll just point out a few of them to you. So some key days during the season of Christmas which runs between December 24th and January 6th because that's a fi fixed feast time. On December 25th we have the feast of the nativity which we call Christmas Day. On December 26th we have the feast of Saint Stephen and I'm sure that you may recall that song that is sung around Christmas, Good King Wenceslas Lutal, on the Feast of St. Stephen. It was the day after Christmas. And then on December 27, we have the Feast of St. John the Evangelist. And we're going to see how, how pivotal St. John the Evangelist becomes in the whole Christmas message and how his amount of Christmas helps us to focus in a different way on the season. Then December 28th, we have the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And this is when we remember St. Matthew's account of the birth of Christ, where Herod ordered that all male children two years and under in Jerusalem should be killed. And so we remember on that day, all persons who are victims of violence or any form of oppression of any kind, and especially our children. And then on January 1st, we have the Feast of the Holy Name or the Feast of the Circumcision of our Lord. And this is in keeping with the law of Leviticus chapter 12, where it says that if a woman gives birth to a male child, eight days after he should be circumcised and he should be given his name, etc. So let us just look at the season proper, Christmas. Just to take a look at our pie chart, we've gone through Advent, which is the blue piece on the top with the little pink. And now we're in Christmas time. And as I said, the liturgical color is white or gold. And you'll see that represented on the pie chart. 
The season of Christmas got its name from the Mass of the day. The Mass of Christ is Christ Mass. And it was first observed on December 25th in the year 336 AD. Now, it was ratified at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 when they were seeking to fix the major days for Christmas, for Christian feast days. And they decided that December 25th will be the feast of the birth of Christ. We will find out why a little later on. Pope Julius in the year 337 officially declared December 25th as the birthday of Christ. So it's not just a celebration now, he has declared it the birthday of Christ. In some traditions, Christmas is observed on the 6th or the 7th of January, for example, in the Orthodox and the Coptic traditions, and we're going to find out why they do that as well. So let us seek to answer this question. Why December 25th? Why is December 25th pinpointed as the birthday of Christ? There's several reasons, but let's go back to our geography for a bit. We've been doing a bit of geography over the last few weeks. Now, remember that if you look at your screen, we have just come through autumn. We are at the top left of the screen and that arrow that says autumn. We've just come through autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. The days have been getting shorter and shorter and shorter. On December 21st, that is when the sun will be shining on the lowest point that it will shine overhead on the earth. And that is on the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23.5 degrees below the equator. Because the earth is tilted away from the sun at this time and the Northern Hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, the Northern Hemisphere will experience more darkness than the Southern Hemisphere. And that's why at this time of year, we go into winter. And that December 21st is known as the winter solstice. Now, what would have happened? Ancients would have recognized on December 20, the days are getting darker. And in primitive times, people would have believed that the world was coming to an end. There's less time to look for food. There's less time to go hunting and so on. And people are believing that the gods have forsaken us. Everything is falling apart. The world is coming to an end. But then over time, they would realize that it's not coming to an end. It's just a cycle. The sun will come back. The light will come back and the days will begin to get longer again. And so what they did is that on December 21st, the shortest day of the year, they observed that. But then a few days after, they celebrated the return of the light. And so people would have various things they would do at that point in time, but it was a time of great celebration because the light is coming back. We can go back and hunt for longer periods of time. The gods have not forsaken us. So this is a time for celebration. And so most cultures and religions have some festival or observance relating to light at this time of year. Okay. And it coincides with the winter solstice. The winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, December 21st, shortest day of the year. But then after that, as the earth goes around the sun, the sun begins to shine overhead further and further up till it comes to the equator. And then it goes right up to the top for summer. And so it is a time for celebration. So what did people do? Let's look at some cultures. In Scandinavia and parts of Northern Europe, the winter solstice is called Yule. And what would happen in primitive times is people would go into the woods and cut down a tree and bring it into their homes and burn it as a symbol that the light is returning, a symbol of the celebration of the, the return of the light. I'm sure that some of us would have received Christmas cards with an image similar to the one on the screen at this point in time. But that is really a symbol of the Yule and not necessarily a symbol of Christmas, all right? It, is a, it comes from the old Scandinavian, Northern Euro European practice of burning a log 
in celebration that the darkness is going and the light is going to return. Likewise, in Jewish culture, around this time of year, within the latter portion running from autumn into winter, they also have their festival of lights, which is Hanukkah. Now, the theological significance of Hanukkah dates back to about the year 164 BC, when after the Maccabean revolt and the fighting between the Jews, Judas Maccabeus and his family, and the Greeks, when the Jews took back over the temple, they had a candlelight march back into the temple as a symbol that the light is returning to the temple because the temple had been desecrated by the Greeks by they set up a statue for Zeus in the temple. That's their Greek god. And they also sacrificed pigs on the altar. So this was the symbol of the cleansing of the temple that the darkness was leaving the temple and light was returning. Of course, that is the theological significance, but it may have had its grounding in the fact that around this time of year, there's a transition of darkness and light. Now, Hanukkah is a movable feast. So for example, in 2016, Hanukkah was a nine day period that began on December 24th and ran until January 1st. So it moves, the dates move from, from year to year but it falls somewhere within the time of this transition of darkness and light. Quite similarly, the Hindu festival of Diwali. Diwali also falls in that quadrant of the year when darkness and light are transitioning. And so the Hindus, again, this is a movable festival, so the dates change from year to year. And of course, one of the most recent ones is the African-American festival of Kwanzaa, which falls on December 26th. But what really happened in the time when Christianity was in its embryonic stages? What were people observing at that time? To understand this, we must go into the practices of the Greco-Roman world. What was happening in Rome at the time? In Rome, they used to celebrate the festival of Saturnalia. And this was observed between December 17th and 23rd in honor of the god Saturn, who was a, an agricultural god. Listen. The festival to celebrate the god Saturn was marked with debauchery. It was marked with wild partying, drinking, and what they call Wasseling. I don't know if that word rings a bell for you. Wasseling. There is a Christmas, I'm putting Christmas in inverted commas, a Christmas carol that we still sing. And I heard it sung in a church at a Christmas concert once. Here we go, a wasseling among the leaves so green. Da, 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 da. Wasseling really means wild partying, drinking, going from house to house and drinking. And if you listen to some of our, our Christmas songs, I'm using Christmas again in inverted commas from the Caribbean, drink a rum and a punch of prima or Barons, neighbor, neighbor, open the door, neighbor, or what we used to do here, Ecuador, Ecuador, here I come, open the window. Yeah, all of those things have their roots somewhere else. And it's believed that the, originated out of the festival of Saturnalia, which was a festival filled with partying, wild partying, and exchange of roles. Men will dress as women, women will dress as men. Slaves will rule their masters for the day. Um, you will elect an order, of, a, a lord of misrule at your party and the Lord of Misrule, anything, anything the Lord of Misrule told you to do, you had to do. If he told you to strip naked and dance, you strip naked and that. That was how Saturnalia was celebrated. 
this whole that there. Also in Rome, you had the festival of Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, or the birth of the unconquered sun. Remember what is happening on the outside. December 21st, the darkest day of the year, the shortest day of the year. But then over time, they realized that gradually the light returns. So December 25th became the day to celebrate the return of the sun or the birth of the unconquered sun. The sun has not been conquered. And so on December 25th, they celebrated that day. And the story has it that in Rome, the, the, the principal god served was Mithra. It's important to understand Mithraism because Mithraism preceded Christianity as the official religion of Rome. And one of the things I would have said early in this study is that we do not recreate the wheel, we do not reinvent it. We simply modify it and move along. All right. Now, who is Mithra? Mithra was an Indo-Persian deity, and he did back to about the fourth millennia BC. He became popular in Rome sometime around the third century BC and became the main religion of the militia, the military in, the, in Rome. And so most Roman emperors had a temple dedicated to Mithra in their, in their precincts. So Mithra was very forceful in Rome and the celebration of the festival of the unconquered sun was a prime festival in Roman culture. But I just want to give you a glimpse of some things about Mithra. The story of Mithra says, he was born in a cave on the 25th of December to a virgin. He was the sun god who served as mediator between the sky and the earth. He had 12 satellites, which are the 12 zodiac signs. The great festivals of Mithra were around the time of the winter solstice and the vernal equinox, which is what we refer to as Christmas and Easter now. Mithra shared a meal with his fathers before his death, and it was a meal of bread and wine. He returned to earth as king, and one of the principal symbols of Mithra is the lamb. And Mithra's sacred day was Sunday. Of course, he was the unconquered sun, so his day would be the day devoted to the sun. Now, I just want to make something clear here. Each day of the week is dedicated to one of the heavenly bodies. For example, Sunday is the sun. Monday or Lunis is the moon. Tuesday, which is Martis, is Mars. Wednesday is Miracles or Mercury, which is Mercury. Thursday is Hue, is or Jodi, which is Jupiter. And Friday is Bien, is or Vendredi, which is Venus. And Saturday, Sabado, Sunday, Saturday, Saturn. All right, so each, each day of the week is dedicated to one of the heavenly bodies. This is how the ancients related time and their existence. Okay. Now, once Christianity became the official religion of Rome, Mithra's temples or chapels were converted into Christian churches. And so Mithraism plays a very critical role in what will emerge as the understandings of the Christian church and Christianity and some of the practices of Christianity, all right? Now, when we read the early Christian writings, the earliest writing in the New Testament is somewhere between 47 and 51 AD. That would be about say 17 to 20 years after Jesus died, after the crucifixion of Jesus. And Paul was the earliest writer in the New Testament. The gospels, Paul did not know the gospels. The gospels were written after the death of Paul. And so when one reads the writings of Paul, 
Paul does not seem to take Mithraism too seriously. It doesn't really turn up in much of his writings. What turns up is his conflict with Judaism, because at this time, Christianity is claiming to be a part of Judaism, and Judaism is now saying, we don't want you all near us because what you're saying is crazy. And so Paul is at loggerheads with Jews, and it comes out in a lot of his work. Similarly, the Synoptic Gospels, the two at least, which give accounts of Jesus' birth, which are, which are Matthew and Luke, do not seem to take Mithraism too seriously. What they're dealing with is Judaism. So in both Matthew and Luke, their accounts of the birth of Jesus are linking him to Old Testament prophecies. Let's just look at a bit of that. In Matthew 1, verse 22 and 23, and Luke 1, 26 to 35, they point to the prophecy of Isaiah 7, and verse 14, which says, well, Isaiah actually says, Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what Matthew and Luke is saying here is the prophecy that Isaiah gave in 714, this Jesus we're telling you about is the fulfillment of this prophecy. So they are trying to keep the, the, the Jewish grounding, Christianity grounded in Judaism by linking Jesus to the prophecy of the Old Testament. Likewise, where Jesus was born, the prophecies of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 both Luke and Matthew point to Micah 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So again, both Gospels seek to have Jesus born in Bethlehem to make the point that he is the fulfillment of what the prophet Micah says. Now, just a little bit of trivia. When one studies the Gospels according to St. Matthew and St. Luke, they actually have Jesus being born at least 12 years apart because St. Matthew's Gospel places him in the time of Herod the Great. Now, Herod died in the year 4 BC. And according to Matthew's account, Herod perceived that Jesus would have been at least two years old by the time, based on the time that the Magi would have given them. So we have to put the birth of Jesus somewhere around 6 BC. Luke, on the other hand, says that Jesus was born when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Quirinius did not become governor of Syria until the year 6 AD, which is 12 years later. And so both accounts do not line up in terms of time, but the point that they are making is that Jesus was born in Bethlehem because for them, that is important because it grounds Christianity in the traditions of the Old Testament and creates a continuum. John, however, differs. And remember earlier I said that the Feast of St. John falls on the 27th of December. Well, the gospel according to St. John is very pivotal in understanding how the early church will emerge in terms of its understanding of the birth of Jesus and its relation to Mithraism. So the gospel according to John seems to be very aware of the Saturnalia and Mithra traditions and actually presents a counterposition. Now, John, the gospel according to John is the last of the four to have been written, we believe. It was written sometime in the last decade of the first century, between AD 90 and AD 100. By this time, Christianity has spread into the Greco-Roman world and is very much cemented in various parts of the Greco-Roman world through the churches that St. Paul would have built, etc. So Christianity now does not only have to answer its questions from Judaism, but it now has to answer questions from the culture in which it finds itself. And as I pointed out, in Rome, Saturnalia and Mithraism were key religions practiced at the time. So what does John say about the birth of Jesus? 
You may notice that St. John doesn't have any birth narrative about Jesus being born in Bethlehem or any wise men or shepherds, no animals, nothing of that nature. John begins his gospel speaking about darkness and light and how Jesus is the true word of God who came into the world. So in verses four to nine, he gives this little synopsis of the transition from light to darkness. Now remember the time of year when Saturnalia and Mithraism are celebrated. They're celebrated around the winter solstice when people are dealing with this transition from the shortest and darkest day of the year to the gradual reemergence of light. And here's what John has to say. John chapter one, verses four to nine, and take note of the point, portions I've highlighted in red. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus is the true light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Remember, Mithra is the unconquered sun. But Mithra goes through this cycle where we go into darkness, and then he has to emerge. John is saying, no, this is the true light that shines in the darkness and the darkness never overcomes it. And then he goes on to say in verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So Jesus, John presents Jesus as the true light, as opposed to a light that goes through this cyclical rising and waning. Jesus is the true light that enlightens the world. Now we're going to see how that light is to be interpreted by the Christian, because remember I said, the church is really taking what is happening on the outside and telling us what should happen on the inside. So outside, as people are celebrating the return of light from darkness, so too must the Christian become more and more enlightened in his or spiritual journey. Let's look at some of the hymns that we sing at Christmas. And when we're finished, tell me honestly if you saw some of these things. The very first hymn we're going to look at is hymn 68. Look at this second line of one of the verses of hymn 68. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son, S-U-N, of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. And light and life there goes back to John 1 and verse 4. In him was life, and this life gave light to people. Risen with healing in his wings. This is how the herald angels sing. Okay, So notice what the Christian church is saying. Just as people on the outside are observing the return of the sun, S-U-N, the physical sun, and celebrating the return of the physical light. We are celebrating the coming of the sun of righteousness, the light of righteousness that will enlighten the whole world and enlighten our lives, okay? So the church is really taking what is happening on the outside and translating it to what the Christian should, in, should reflect on on the inside. Now, the church does not hide from the fact that we are influenced by our environment. We all feel what happens around that time of year. There are very few people who do not go through a change of mood around that time of year. I think Nat Ken Cole said, it's that time of year when the world falls in love. And that is because the mood on the outside is a mood of hunkering down and settling down. And then through tradition, the joyousness of the celebration of light. Now look at, Hymn 77, this is, O come all ye faithful. God of God, light of light, lo he abhors, not the virgin. Very God, begotten, not created, O come let us adore him. Now, God of God, light of light, that comes from the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed emerged from the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD. And it was the Council of Nicaea where the date of Christmas as December 25th was first tabled. 
the Council of Nicaea was seeking to date its major feasts, Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and so on. And they had set December 25th as the date for the birth of Jesus. So God of God, light of light. They're really harping back to St. John's Gospel, which is really dealing with the challenges of Saturnalia and Mithra and everything that is taking place in the Greco-Roman world to say, look, don't follow these people who are just celebrating the physical return of light. Let us celebrate the coming of the true light that enlightens us and guides us in this life. Similarly, a hymn that we don't sing too often, I don't know if many people know it. O come redeemer of our race, thou brightness of the Father's face, hymn 79. In one verse it says, thou art the very light of light. Unfailing hope in sin's dark night, hear thou the prayers thy people pray, the wide world o'er this blessed day. Now, Thou art the very light of light. That goes back to John chapter 1 and verse 9. The true light that enlightens all people was coming into the world. And then John chapter 1 and verse 5, unfailing hope in sin's dark night. Remember, John said, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. So darkness here is not a physical darkness. It's the darkness of sin. And the light of Christ, which is the light of righteousness, conquers the darkness of sin and dispels it. Okay. Likewise, my favorite Christmas hymn from one of my favorite saints, St. Ambrose, O come redeemer of mankind, appear. St. Ambrose here quotes Psalm 19, verses 1 to 5. Psalm 19 and verse 5. In this particular verse, he says, from his bright chamber, virtue's holy shrine, the royal bridegroom cometh to the day of twofold substance, human and divine, as giant swift rejoicing on his way. Doesn't seem to make much sense if we're just reading it like that, right? But when one reads Psalm 19 and verse 5, Psalm 19 is actually speaking about the sun. In Psalm 19 and verse 5, it says, he has set the pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of its chamber and it runs like a champion on its course. And so what St. Ambrose here is saying is that Jesus is the true son. He is the royal bridegroom that cometh to the day. And just like a champion, the sun runs on its course. Jesus, like a giant swift, rejoices on his way. So he is taking a passage from the Old Testament that spoke about the sun to speak about this sun of righteousness that now trumps the unconquered sun that the Greeks and the Romans were celebrating. So Christianity is making some serious theological points, pushing back on the culture in which it finds itself. Okay. So what will eventually happen December 25th was the birthday of Mithra. Christians took it over. It was the birthday of the unconquered son, and Christians say no. It is the birthday of the son of righteousness who conquered darkness and the world and enlightens all people. And so now our focus is no longer on the physical transition, but the spiritual transition. Right? So the theme of light and darkness dominates the gospel according to St. John and sets the, the platform for what will come in the next season. But Mithra, what is important to note is that Mithra was observed on a physical basis. Jesus is observed as the son of righteousness on a spiritual basis. And he is the son that the darkness cannot conquer. He is not like Mithra that goes through these cycles and you have the darkest day of the year and then people are wondering if the sun is coming back. No. He is the true sun that never sets. And it is for this reason, when we're looking at what is happening here in the Greco-Roman world, how Christianity took over the chapels of Mithra, and we see here that 
Mithra that existed like millennia before Christianity. Mithra's birthday is now taken over by the church as the birth of the son of righteousness. One, I, I can't remember the saying, but if you're going to take the people's day, you have to take the baggage that comes with it. And that is what happens to Christianity. Calls to put Christ in Christmas are relevant only for Christians. Perhaps the better call is to remove Christmas out of the Yule because the Yule tide existed before. So many practices surrounding Christmas are, are really vestiges of pagan origins of the season. Let us look at some of them. Many of the songs we hear at Christmas are not Christmas carols. I think that is something as Christians we must come to grips with. Many of the songs that play on the radio are not Christmas carols. They are Yuletide carols, just totally different. Deck the halls with vows of holly has nothing to do with Christmas. It has to do with the Yuletide. Have your, even, even have yourself a merry little Christmas confuses the two. Because it says, have yourself a merry little Christmas, make the Yuletide gay. <laughs> so you're, you're joining two different things. And things like chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Those are not Christmas images. Those are Yuletide images. So Christianity not only took over the day, but ended up with many of the practices of Christmas, of, of the Yule. Let us see what some of them are. Ah, here are these two pictures. I'm sure you would receive cards with similar images on both sides. But they're two different things. One is a Christmas tree, and one represents Yule logs. The Yule logs have very little to do with Christmas. The Christmas tree speaks to the light of Christ that we observe as Christians coming into the world. And it's really an electronic version of the Yule log, really. But we refer to it as a Christmas tree. So what you're, what you're really having is that when Christianity took over these, this holiday on December 25th, which was the celebration of the return of light and the return of the sun, also coming with that were some of the practices that people held on that day. And they brought them over into the celebration of this Christmas. So for some people, I'm sure it was just a change of a name and not really anything of any depth. They continued in their merriment. They continued with their carol singing. They continued all the other things they were doing. Quite similarly to what has come to us in the 21st century. Because as I said, many at Christmas time, I am sure there are more Yuletide carols on the radio than Christmas carols. Because many of them have nothing to do with Christ and the true light that enters the world, which is what the focus of Christmas is. What they deal with are is winter, and the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And as long as you love me so, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. All those are Yuletide carols. They deal with the physical transition that is taking place and nothing to do with the spiritual reality of what Christmas ought to be. And so I'm sure one could guess at some point in time, the church would have had some Puritan who would have said, this is nonsense, we need to stop this. And that came in the person of Oliver Cromwell in the 17th century. Oliver Cromwell, a Protestant Puritan, banned Christmas for a few years in the 17th century in England. It was also banned in Boston, Massachusetts. And I actually have the law that was promulgated at that time. It said, for pre preventing disorders arising in several places within this jurisdiction, by reason of some still observing such festivals as were superstitiously kept in other communities, to the great dishonor of God and the offense of others, 
It is therefore ordered by this court and the authority thereof that whosoever shall be found observing any such day as Christmas or the like, either by forbearing of labor, feasting, or any other way upon any such account as aforesaid, every such person so offending shall pay for every such offense five shilling as a fine to the county. And this is from the re records of the Massachusetts General Court. So what is happening here is that some Christians are realizing, just like I, I've mentioned before, you know, Bamba song, put Jesus in your Christmas, put Jesus in your Christmas this year. They're realizing that this Christmas thing these people celebrate have absolutely nothing to do with God, has nothing to do with the, the, the true light that persons should be enlightened with to lead them to better lives and better relationships. This is about the festivities and the partying and the debauchery and all the other things that existed under Saturnalia and Mithraism and so on. And so it is best to stop it because it is not doing any honor to God. The reality is that over time, what has happened is that Christmas has become so entrenched and that it has become a brand. And it has become a brand that reaches across borders of culture and religion. I just want you to, in 2008, the Oxford City Council in England decided that they were going to change their Christmas-like festival to the winter-like festival to make it more inclusive. And this provoked outrage among shoppers in the city who called for a return to tradition. And here's what the chairman of the Muslim Council of Oxford said. I'm really upset about this. Christians, Muslims, and other religions all look forward to Christmas. Now, <laughs> Yeah, what has happened is that Christmas has become a brand. It has become a brand that is good for um, economic enterprise. It has become a brand that is good for events and so on. And so to change the name of Christmas now, it's become so entrenched that it will affect the branding of events at that time of year, but really, it has nothing to do with Christmas per se. It has to do with how the, the events of the Yule and other practices over the centuries of human existence have come to be amalgamated in this one festival that we now refer to as Christmas, but really does not match the theological significance of what we are called to observe as Christmas, as Christians. So really, that's a point to know. The liturgy, of, the liturgy of the church is structured to help us to keep our lives in balance. As I would have pointed out as we looked at Advent, as the days are shortening, remember you are part of this. Just those leaves are falling out the tree. One day you're going to go. So stay away, keep watch, keep your life in focus, maintain your relationship with God. Likewise for Christmas, just as on the outside, the darkness comes on December 21st and then gradually emerges, the, the world emerges back into light. We are being reminded, so too must you remove the darkness from your life by incorporating the true son of righteousness who will give you give light to your life and give you life in this world. Now, just some points to note. Do not get into any arguments about when Christ was born because we do not know. Do not get into any arguments about the historicity of what is found in the Gospels because, as I've pointed out several times before, history for the ancients was not a collection of facts but a collection of truths. And the truth can be couched in a myth. It is the truth that is important, not necessarily that it is a fact that this happened at this time or that happened at this time. So the truth for us is that Jesus, God sent his son into the world, who is the true light that brings life to humanity. Now, just to prepare us for our next session and 
what Epiphany is in relation to Christmas. Epiphany really comes about because of an inaccuracy that people had in measuring time. Up to the year 15, up to the 1500s, people worked with the calendar, which is the Julian calendar. But it was found that the Julian calendar was inaccurate. And the lost time, lost one day every 314 years. So one day would be lost. And so over time, what happened is that all of the significant events went out of sync with the time that humanity was keeping. The solstice was out of sync. The equinox was out of sync. Everything was out of sync. And then in 15, the 1500s, Pope Gregory VIII introduced what we now know as the Gregorian calendar, which is the one we use in this part of the world. The Gregorian calendar was much more accurate than the Julian calendar and made up for the inaccuracies that it had. And therefore, in 1582, on October 4th, they decided to correct things. And the next day it became October 15th. They lost 10 days. They just blanked out 10 days of the year. And that was to bring the calendar in line with what, with the rotation of the earth and what was really happening within the cosmos. In England will make that shift in the year 1752 when they lost 11 days from September 7th, 2nd to September 4th. September 2nd just went to September 14th in the year 1752 and they just cut out those 11 days. What has happened is that that is now the space between Christmas and Epiphany. What is now observed as Epiphany on January 6th used to be December 25th under the Julian calendar. So in some parts of England, you will still hear people refer to January 6th as old Christmas, because that used to be December 25th before the days were cut out. And so when we're singing the 12 days of Christmas and all those other things, what we're really observing is the transition that would have taken place from the in the shift from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And so the next season, as you will find out next week, is also a festival of light, which is the, feast, the season of Epiphany. It's a season of enlightenment. And so we're going to look at that. There are some churches um, that, still observe, that still use the Julian calendar, for example, the Orthodox Church and the Coptic churches still use the Julian calendar. So their Christmas day will be somewhere around January 6th or 7th. And by extension, Epiphany will be 12 days later, somewhere down the road by the 19th or so. So what we now observe as Epiphany used to be Christmas before. And so the change in the calendar gave rise to the new season, which we now refer to as Epiphany. And I'm going to show you next week how the church has linked its gospel readings and its teachings from the, the New Testament to the season of Epiphany to speak about enlightenment as well. Because as we go from December 21st and we move, the days are getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And so by the time we go through the season of Epiphany, the days are brightening up. And so just as outside is getting brighter, so too on the inside, you must become more and more and more enlightened. And so Epiphany is a season of light and growth as well. I wish to thank you very much for your patience and I will entertain any questions you may have at this time. Do we just see? 
I have a question. Sure. Um, which came first, the God of Saturn or Mithraism? Okay, um, cultures borrow from each other. So Saturnalia was really, is really what emerged out of the worship of Cronus. Cronus was the Greek God who, and the father of Zeus, who would, um, who ate his children, really. Every, every, every child that was born to Cronus, when the mother brought him, Cronus swallowed the child, but when Zeus was born, she wrapped, she, she wrapped a rock in cloth and gave it to Cronus, and Cronus coughed, when he swallowed the rock, he coughed up the other children, and so coming up, coming out of the Feast of Cronus was the giving of gifts of dollies and so on, which came into Saturnalia. Now, you want to know if Saturnalia preceded Mithraism. In Rome, Saturnalia would have been an indigenous religion of Rome. Mithraism isn't. Mithraism is a Persian religion, an Iranian religion that was adopted into Rome in around the third century BC. So I believe that Saturnalia would have preceded Mithraism in Rome. Okay. Yeah. I see. So another question. Um, yes. Did, was Mithraism influenced by Saturnalia? I can't say so because Mithraism, as I would have said, existed about four millennia before Christianity. And so that would have had its grounding in Indo-Persian religion. So it would have come over. Once, once cultures collide, they all mix in some way. But in terms of the extent of the mixing, I cannot say. But I, know, I believe that Mithraism would have been a well-developed religion before it came to Rome. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions? Anything else? Question. Yes, sir. Well, comment first and then question. Um, I just want to thank you very much for making this available. I only realized that it was going to happen sometime earlier this afternoon, mm. but I'm really glad I came and I'm quite fascinated. It's a lot to take in, so yeah. I don't really have um, <laughs> any major questions except to, um, I noticed that you're recording, so I'm wondering where can I you know, engage with this again uh, after this session is closed so I can sort of review the information and continue the absorption. Okay, thank you, sir. I don't know how to um, bring people up on the screen. I, I'm supposed to be a co-host, but I'm sorry I didn't, I wasn't able to highlight you, but thank you very much for the kind words. It will be available on our YouTube channel, St. George Parish Church Outreach. Okay. So you'll be able to access it after today. Okay, thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Um, good night. Good um, night. This is my, yes, please. This is my first of the session. The general just said, I only saw it today. Mm -hmm. I'm from the St. George January St. Jude's. Yes. But, yes, please. <laughs> but it is a lot to take in. I was just these different, um, the shift between the seasons and between the different, it gives you a lot to think about. Though. It gives you a lot yeah. to go as we were to come into the Christian light from to separate ourselves from this, it mm. is a lot. So I yeah. have to go yeah. back, as you said, in the recording and then pick up and see where things but I'll, I'll be here again next week and to continue. Thank you very much. It's very thank you, you're welcome. Okay, thank one you. The, one, thank you. One of the challenges we will all face as Christians is the fact that. We are people of faith, but we're also physical beings who are in, 
who are affected by the environments in which we live, even the, the natural course of things. As I would have started this session, I quoted the carpenters, rainy days and Mondays always get me down. If you speak to someone who has, who has lived in a more northern clime for a long time, they will tell you that during winter, nobody talks to anybody. You just pass them straight with your face up. But once the sun comes out in spring, people are lying on the grass and everybody's hailing everybody after that because the, the environment affects moves. So it will be very hard to let go of some of the things that are so entrenched in us that we can't even differentiate whether they're Christmas things or Yuletide things or something from somewhere else. And as I said, even in our Caribbean tradition, a lot of our Caribbean um christmas songs are really yuletide carols and not really christmas carols but it'd be hard to differentiate and as i would have pointed out christmas has become such a brand that you use christmas and yuletide interchangeably as i said in that song have yourself a merry little christmas make the yuletide gay so you're, you're, you're marrying two separate traditions. What, what were meant to be separate traditions. Right, so I'm back, I'm Reverend Rogers. Yes, sir. So I was taught for decades that every word written in the Bible is true. How then could Mark and Luke- Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke, sorry. Uh, present different dates for Christmas birth. This is as I said, um, ancient writers were not so much consumed with facts as history as we are consumed with facts as history. For us, history is facts. For them, history was truths. So for them, the truth is found in the story. The truth is found even in the myth that they're creating. And for them, their truth is that God sent his son into the world and he came for the liberation of all humanity. They're not so much caught up with the facts because most likely they didn't know them. One, one must read the gospels from the back to the front. The back would be the more accurate portion of the gospel because it is only after the death and resurrection of Jesus that people started reflecting and saying, but you know, he must have been the Messiah. And in Jewish tradition and in ancient tradition, anyone who is here of a story must have a birth narrative. And so you go back and you shape the birth narrative. It is not that the early Christians who compiled the New Testament didn't realize that there were differences in Matthew. And I don't think they were waiting on us to find that. They just were not concerned about that. Their concern is to get the truth out there that Jesus is the Son of God and he came for the salvation of the world. But you're being very, um, very uh, granular because I am my thinking fact equals truth. Hmm. Yes, fact equals truth, but the truth. <laughs> the truth that they're conveying for them is that Jesus Christ is the son of God and Jesus Christ came in. That is their truth for them to convey that truth to you. That, that is their fact that he is the son of God. And for them to convey that to you, they do so within the context of the narratives that they've presented in the gospel. So, just to follow on that, <laughs> um, is it, am, am I to understand that the narratives may not necessarily be based on facts? So yes. the whole manger, the whole manger setting, um, even the visitation of the angel to Mary, that annunciation experience, etc. Uh, how do we treat with that? Well, I'm, I'm, um, my, my mind is my mind is now reeling. <laughs> <laughs> if, 
if that was not true, would it take away from, from the fact that Christ has been a force of liberation and an agent of peace and reconciliation in the world? No, because we do have evidence that he did live on the earth and that he, he taught as he, as, yeah, we, we have other facts. <laughs> we See, have other facts. You have, to, you have to put yourself in the place of the early Christians. They are trying to make sense of a tradition and to get it out there in the best way that they can get it out there. And that is why there are some gospels that were accepted, some weren't, etc. Because what they were trying, what the church was trying to do was just to find a core that would form what we'll call the canon or the what something that can guide the life of this community. But as in everything else, there would have, there have been differing opinions and different traditions and different accounts. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. But the truth, the truth underlying all of that is that this Christ came into the world and he brought justice and peace and liberation to all humanity. Okay. That, that is the but, core of the Christian message. And I, I, I deeply appreciate that. But part of the way we perceive Jesus in coming to this earth is from the perspective of the king of kings as it were discarding the glory of heaven and being born in in, in humble form um even to the point of rejected form you mm -hmm. know there's no room in the inn sort of thing um it and it frames very deeply how we perceive christ uh, from the very beginning, uh, as, as, a, as a symbol of humility, you know. So if we do not, if we're not able to place weight, factual weight, on those accounts, how does that affect our, our, our sense of um, value on that, that humble beginning and that humble nature? I mean, yes, we do see the evidence as he grew, but even that original situation how do we treat with how we view christ if we can't make sense of whether certain things are true or not in that in those accounts okay as i said each each writer has an audience it is believed that luke is writing to a gentile audience matthew is writing to a jewish audience john is beyond the synoptics that he takes it to an esoteric level where he doesn't even speak of the the humanity of christ is bound up in the essence of his divinity in the beginning was the word and the word was with god the word was god and he was the true light that enlightens all people and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us so when john wants when john speaks of jesus for example the i am saying and so on you're not you're to look beyond the persona to the essence of how he has already set him out in the prologue he is the true word he is the true light later on he'll describe him as the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world and these are the images that john wants us to have of jesus so he doesn't even deal with the stable and all those things um matthew and luke are different in that luke is writing to a somewhat gent or from the perspective of a gentile and so what you will see in St. Luke's gospel continuously is how the outsider is brought in. So he's writing with a particular theological perspective. And even in his, in his um, portrayal of the birth of Christ, it is St. Luke who speaks about the Magnificat and the Benedictus. And the Magnificat speaks about the, the rise of the lowly and the bringing down of the mighty. So he's speaking to an audience that is perceived, has been perceived as outcast and are telling them, this Messiah is going to bring you into the fold. Likewise, the shepherds turn up in St. Luke's gospel. They're not there in St. Matthew. The shepherds are there because the shepherds were these 
characters who would go into the field and people felt they spent a little too long out there and probably inhaled a little too much of the things the sheep was producing. So they would come back and tell fairy tale stories and so on. Luke now brings those shepherds into the fold and into this message. And so the outsider is constantly brought in. Matthew has a different perspective. Matthew is to link Jesus to Jewish tradition and to tell Jews, you don't believe these things. Do you know that people are coming from all over the world to see this king and you all haven't received him? So Matthew has now the Magi, which Luke doesn't have. And so, so it is about perspective of the writers. So they're shaping the narrative of how they, and remember I said, you're, you're, you're writing after the fact. So they have an image of Jesus in their mind and what they're doing is putting this image into his birth. Right, but the question is, um, you, you know, like, <laughs> did, they, with the, did they just come up with it? Or, or was it that they were told some of these stories, I know, um, and they used the stories or the narrative that they needed from the body of stories that they were told, or was it that they just decided to contrive these in order to, 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 to bring up a message? I, that's what I'm trying to do. As in every community, there's oral tradition, and in, in, in this community, oral tradition weighed heavily. It is believed that Matthew and Luke had access to a common document, which we refer to in biblical scholarship as Q. So there were other people writing. These are just the, the gospels that were seen as canonical and orthodox that could be used as the rule of faith for the community. So there were lots of other perspectives and they may have borrowed from those as well. It's not something that fell out of the sky in the need. It was something that developed over time. Right, okay, I appreciate that, thank you. No problem at all. Any further questions, anyone? Okay. I don't see anything in the chat, so I trust that there are no other questions. Next week at the same time, 6 p.m., we will look at the Feast of Epiphany and some of the images that are there and how the church seeks to speak to this continued message of enlightenment as we go away from the festival of light, which is now Christmas. Remember Epiphany, January 6th used to be December 25th. And so you now have an additional season of light attached to, attached to what is being presented as Christmas. And so now Epiphany takes on its own, its own character as its own season of light and enlightenment. And it matches what is taking place on the outside. As we go next week, I will show how we're moving now from, we're moving through winter into spring. So the days are getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And the human being, the Christian is being called to be more enlightened and more enlightened and more enlightened as we go forward. So next week, the season of Epiphany. <laughs>